I implemented the same web app in Rust and Zig, and the differences in implementation turned out to be really, really interesting. The front end is implemented in HTMX, but here's the Zig code. If you're new to Zig, there's a lot in here that's gonna look very, very confusing. We'll go into all this in a minute. But this is a different universe. Even if you're coming from another language like C++ or C where you have to manage memory yourself, this is a different ballgame. And I'll get into why. And this is the Rust version. Without going into any detail whatsoever, you can kind of tell it's a lot different. We'll compare and contrast these and talk about the nuances in a little bit. But first we need to talk about HTMX because this web app was actually borrowed from one of the examples on the official HTMX website. And it's a simple web app that has some data about a person. It's got a button to click to, that you can click to edit. You can change some of the fields and click submit. And those fields are persisted and you get, you're given a read only version of the data again. And then you can edit and you can also cancel, which gives you the original data. And this is a good example to use to start talking about HTMX. The idea behind HTMX is to, we have these patterns that are commonly implemented on the client side and everybody's kind of implementing the same thing, right? The user clicks a button, we go and retrieve some data from an API and replace part of the DOM with the contents of that response. HTMX takes those commonly implemented client side patterns and packages them up and makes them available to the developer through attributes that we actually add to our HTML elements. HTMX provides this attribute hxget, and we can put hxget on a button, and we assign it a value, which can be the path of an API that is implemented in our backend. When the user clicks this button, a request will be made to that API, and the HTMX framework expects an HTML response from that API. It's gonna look at where the nearest HX target attribute is. In our case, it's on this outer div here. It's gonna replace that outer div with the response from that API that we specified for HX get. So it's gonna make a request to contact slash one slash edit. And in this particular case, that's going to be an editable version of our user data. So after that response is processed, we're gonna wind up with something like this. It's gonna be a form with editable fields. And this works in a similar way. It has a submit and a cancel button. The cancel button has an HX get attribute that is assigned slash contact slash one. So upon clicking cancel, it's gonna make a get request to that API. It's gonna replace the entire form with this again. So we're gonna be back to where we started. If the user clicks submit, we can see there's an HX put attribute on the form itself. So a put request is gonna be made to slash contact slash one. It's gonna actually put that form data that the user entered. That API is gonna presumably save off that user data wherever it wants to store it. It's gonna send back an HTML response, which is going to be also similar to this. The difference is that the user values have been changed. So that is HTMX in a nutshell. The beauty of HTMX is that we're not writing any client-side JavaScript. You could make the case that something like changing from this to this should not necessarily need a request to the backend server. But HTMX is a great tool in a lot of situations. And the idea that you don't have to write any client-side JavaScript, yet you can still have this web application with rich client-side interactivity is pretty nice. To implement the backend for this web app, we're gonna need four routes. And the first is the index route. That's the route that's gonna return the HTML that contains the HTML tag, the head, the body tag, and that initial load of the user data. The second route is that put, so when the user actually submits that form, this API is responsible for storing the data the user changed in wherever we wanna store it. In, in our case, that's just gonna be in memory. Then we have an API for making a request to, to just replace the, that form, the editable form, with a read-only view of the data in the situation where the user clicks the cancel button instead of submit. And then of course we have the edit API, which is gonna handle the scenario where the user clicks that, this click to edit button, it just returns a, an editable version of the data. So those are the four routes that we need to implement. And in Rust and Zig, we do have quite a few options for HTTP servers and web frameworks. In Rust, the two most popular examples are Actix and Axum. I happen to go with Axum, but neither is a bad choice. On the Zig side of things, things aren't quite as established in terms of a small number of frameworks that people just go to. I actually wound up going with one called http.zig. It's pretty feature rich, it's low level, you have full control over things like MIME types, you have full access to the requests and response objects. It seemed to do everything that I needed. First, let's take a look at the Rust implementation. We have this person static variable that is 
ultimately a person info struct, which has those three fields that we saw inside a read write lock, which is inside a lazy lock. So lazy lock actually doesn't allow you by default to modify anything that's inside of it. That's why we need read write, read write lock, which gives us interior mutability. It gives us a safe way of reading and writing this data, even though lazy lock gives us a shared reference to the data. In the main function, we're just setting up the listener and all the routes that we just mentioned. We went over those already. The index API is what's going to serve up that initial HTML page with the HTML tag, the head, everything, the body. And it's gonna have a read-only view of the person data in it. To read the person data, we need to get a read lock from that read write lock struct, right? So that's what we do in the first line here. Person winds up getting assigned a, a read lock guard. So when that gets dropped, we're relinquishing automatically. We don't have to explicitly make any calls to do this, but that read lock is going to be released, making others free to potentially write to that data. So read write lock, you can have any number of read locks acquired at any given time, but only one write lock, and the write lock can only be acquired when there are no read locks acquired. After that lock is acquired, we're gonna call the format macro, which is the way to interpolate strings into other strings. Quick side note here, as written in the video, both the Zig and Rust versions of the application are going to be vulnerable to cross-site scripting attacks because we're not escaping special characters. We're just using the format macro and alloc print to interpolate strings into other strings. That is not how you should do things in the real world. The only reason I'm doing that is to keep things as simple as possible for the video. In the real world, you should use a templating framework, like in Rust, you have a schema, and that'll do the escaping of special characters for you. So just wanted to make that clear. Okay, back to the video. We're interpolating the value here. We're interpolating one value here, and we're denoting that using the curly braces. We're calling this helper function view only person, and that's just returning that HTML for that read only view of the data, because we're gonna need this function elsewhere for when the user hits that cancel button. So we're using it in the index API as well. Pay close attention to this. This looks pretty straightforward in Rust. To interpolate strings into other strings, you first have to allocate memory that's big enough for both strings, right? Completely abstracted away from us in this case, not so in Zig, as you'll see. Then we have the contact edit API, which is essentially the same thing, just the HTML is that editable form. We're still only getting a relock for the person data, but we interpolate the fields into that form as we can see below, so we have the string to interpolate into, and then the curly braces, each place we need to interpolate something in, and then subsequent arguments to the format macro are person.first name, all the fields of person. Before you ask, yes, there, there is a templating engine in Rust called, I think they're the most popular ones called, or one of the most popular ones is called Ascana. Yeah, I'm not averse, I'm not opposed to using that, I just wanted to keep things simple, just so you know. Contact put is the API that's used to actually submit that form data when the user clicks the submit button. The Axum framework will automatically deserialize the form fields into our person info struct, as long as the, the names of the input fields are correspond to the names of the person info struct fields, which they do. It'll automatically deserialize. And then we add a scope here because we're getting a write lock to that person data and we don't wanna hold that write lock longer than we have to. So we do person.write to get that write lock guard. The guard is stored in person. That's going to be relinquished and dropped after this scope ends. So all we're doing after we get that write lock is assigning the new data and then we're, we're out of that scope. The write lock is released. And then we return a read-only view of the person based on the form data that was submitted. Pretty simple. And then cancel edit is, it's kind of like the index API, except we're not returning those HTML and body tags, we're just returning that outer div that the read-only view of the data has. So those are all the Rust APIs. So keep keep this in mind as we look in the Zig version. This is the Zig version, and right out of the gate, there are a lot of things that look very, very different from the Rust version. First of all, thank you to all the kind folks on the Zig Discord server that, that code reviewed this and helped me get it into a better place. We see we have the person struct, and number one, there's no string types. Our strings, our first name, last name, email, they're all slices of 8-bit elements of unknown size. That's what that is. And then we do have, we, that's how we define the struct. We do have a global person variable that we use to store the data, kind of like in Rust. We do have a rewrite lock and it works in a similar way to the Rust version, but it's not actually guarding the data in a way that the compiler can verify. 
it's a completely separate object. And the Rust version, our, our data that we want to guard with the, lo the lock is actually contained in the lock. Not the case here. And then we have this GPA, mine's lower than yours. We have a general purpose allocator. And this is our first taste of the idiom in Zig of using an allocator, explicitly deciding on which allocator you want to use anytime any dynamic memory allocation needs to happen. Most languages, C++, Rust, C, use a global allocator. So even if you're managing memory yourself, you're, you're in charge of freeing it. When you allocate the memory, there's usually not a decision to be made. You're kind of letting the global allocator make that decision. And usually it's just sticking that memory on the heap. There's some situations where a different strategy could be more optimal. And that's kind of the premise behind Zig's idiom of passing around allocators everywhere. And it does make the code more verbose, but there's a case to be made that it's worth it, right? At least in some situations. We're making this GPA, and that's like a general purpose allocator that we're gonna use anytime we need to allocate memory that is not scoped to a particular request. Keep that in mind. To initialize the fields of the struct, we need to perform a few of those dynamic memory allocations. So this allocator dot dupe is a way of allocating a certain number of bytes and then copying the contents of the string literal in the second argument to that newly allocated memory. That's what that's doing. Also try. Try is the equivalent of the question mark operator in Rust. So Rust, if a function returns a result and some, an error happens somewhere in the function and you wanna immediately return and propagate that error up the stack, you would use a question mark operator uh, after the thing that returns a result, and that would take care of that. Try is exactly the same thing. So try is not a try in the sense of like try catch. It's propagating errors up the stack. And we know this function can return an error because of the exclamation mark prior to the void in the return type. So in Rust, we have results that have an error value in the second generic parameter. In Zig, we prefix the return type with an exclamation to indicate that it might return an error. After we've allocated the memory, we can then initialize that stored person global variable. We set up the server. The other important thing in Zig is defer. In Zig, the defer keyword allows us to ensure that this, the preceding code will be executed regardless of whether the function returns early, it completes. By doing defer, we know that server.dnit and server.stop are going to be executed no matter what. So when we go back to look to make sure whether we are deallocating things properly, we can see the defer immediately after the allocation. In this case, it's a, a call to HTTP server.init, but that presumably allocates some memory that is then cleaned up by these defer statements or these uh, deinit and stop functions. Then we set up the four routes that we talked about earlier and we do try server listen and we're good to go. Now, let's look at that index API. Looks a little different, right? On that lock that we, declared at the beginning, we're, we're calling lock shared, which is essentially the same as a read lock in the Rust version. And then we do defer stored person lock dot unlock shared. And that ensures that the lock is released at the end of this scope. Very important. Zig will not enforce this for you. If you don't do this unlock shared, the lock will be acquired and never released. It's not going to save you from that, right? That is one of the key differences between the Rust and the Zig implementations. I can just completely remove this line and there's no compiler errors, nothing, right? In Rust, the lock was released automatically at the end of the scope because the memory for the lock guard was dropped. One of the key differences. Another difference is in this, the equivalent of that format macro in the Rust version, in Zig we have alloc print and that interpolates strings in a way similar to the format function. But alloc print, the first argument to alloc print is an allocator. The HTTP Z framework gives us a, an arena allocator as part of the response object. This is nice because it's expected that we're gonna do some dynamic memory allocations that are specific to the requests that we're handling here. This will ensure that whatever memory we allocate is automatically deallocated when the request is done being processed, when that response is sent off. That's handy. Instead of dealing with each piece of memory individually, we can kind of deal with it all as a whole using this arena allocator. Then the, the string, a multi-line string in Zig is, each line is prefixed with a double backslash. And then we interpolate the value using the, the curly braces, but we have a, a string formatter here. Second argument to alloc print, because it's not a macro, it doesn't have a variable number of arguments like the format macro in the Rust version did. 
So instead, the second argument is a struct of an undefined number of fields. You can put as many fields in there as you want. This dot curly brace syntax actually tells the compiler to infer the type of this struct, which can make things more concise in a lot of situations. And then we actually pass that, that arena allocator to the view only person function, which uses it in its own string formatting operation where it interpolates the, the values, the, the fields of the person into that read-only view of the data. Contact edit is mostly the same. It's still an API that reads the data. It doesn't write any data. And then things get more interesting once we get to contact put. This looks a little scary, right? Let's, let's break it down. Instead of getting a shared lock, we're getting a lock, which is actually the equivalent of a write lock in, in the Rust version. We're still deferring the release of that lock as we should. The framework gives us this form data function that allows us to get at all the fields that were submitted as part of the form from the client. So we can iterate through the field names, pluck out the values and store them in our person variable. In the case of first name, the first thing we're doing is calling realloc on the first name field. Realloc deallocates the memory that's allocated there currently and allocates a new piece of memory. And we specify the length of that memory using the second argument. So however long the value of that field contents is, that's how much memory we're allocating. We're assigning that new memory to store person.firstName, but the, the field does not have the new data yet. That's important. All we've done is allocate the new memory. Then we call memcopy and we're copying the contents of the field to that newly allocated memory. That is how we take data from a put request and put it in the stored person struct. Hopefully this gives you a good sense of the key differences between the Rust implementation and the Zig implementation, because there are some very significant differences in approach between these two versions. Which is better? That depends on what you're going for. But what is clear is that in the Zig version, you do need to be very careful about releasing locks, releasing memory, allocating memory properly. Yeah, I mentioned. I think I mentioned earlier, if, if we didn't use a lock, we could potentially receive a read request between this line and this line. So we could allocate new memory for first name, but we haven't copied the new value to first name yet. So the read request will succeed, the memory has been allocated, but there's no value in there yet. That's something that could potentially happen if we're not using the, these locks. And Zig does not, it will not require you to use these locks like it does in Rust. In Rust, you have to use the read write lock. There's no other option. Zig, you can, you can just delete all the locks and the locking code and it'll still work, right? These are the two web apps. On the left, we have the Rust version. On the right, we have the Zig version. You're not gonna see any differences in functionality. They both work exactly the same way. Oh, really? I feel like I left a lock, some of the lock code. Wait a minute. Yep. I meant to uncomment this and I forgot. And then I ran the, I ran the server and it, it, it was just completely broken. Yeah. Okay. That was a good example of what not to do. Let's try that again. All right. So these are the two web apps. Uh, you're not going to see any differences in functionality. Hopefully no differences. On the left is the Rust version. On the right is the Zig version. You can click to edit for both of them. Um, submit, submit, refresh. They both work exactly the same way. I really hope this has given you a new perspective on the differences between Rust and Zig because the differences are pretty substantial. I think they're both very, very interesting languages. I, lo I like both of them. I think for applications like this, I'm going to stick with Rust. Um, there, there's a case to be made for Zig, but that's just a personal preference. If you like this video, please like and subscribe. This video is actually quite a bit of work, so I'd really appreciate it. If you're not an expert in Rust, there might have been some pieces of syntax you saw in this video that you didn't fully understand. If that's the case, you might be interested in Ultimate Rust Crash Course, which is available on Skillshare, the sponsor of this video. Instructor Nathan Stocks has an engaging style, and I love how he makes heavy use of visuals in the course. Skillshare has thousands of classes across a wide variety of topics like productivity, I'm a fan of Ali Abdal by the way, art, photography, and UX design. UX design is what I'm personally going to be working on because it's become pretty clear to me that I have room for improvement there. Skillshare is the largest online learning community for creatives with thousands of classes led by industry experts across many different topics. It can help you take your career, skills, hobbies, passions, or side hustles to the next level. The first 500 people to use my link in the description will receive a one month free trial of Skillshare. Get started today. If you want a very detailed performance comparison of Rust versus Zig server side frameworks, definitely check out this video. It gives an in-depth comparison of the two under heavy load. Really, really great video. Can't recommend it highly enough. Or if you want another video from me, 
Check out this video right here that YouTube thinks you'll like. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.